ready for a journey into a world that's uh, literally all around us, but we can't even see it. Mm. Today, we're taking a deep dive into the amazing realm of prokaryotes. Oh, I like that. You wanted to get a better understanding of these uh, microscopic wonders. Okay. So we're going to be digging into an excerpt from Microbiology Q&A 4, Prokaryotic Diversity, but OpenStax. It's a great choice. People often think bacteria and picture something that makes you sick. Right. But that's just scratching the surface. Yeah, We're yeah. talking about the most ancient forms of life on Earth. Wow. Bacteria and D. archaea. Okay, let's back up for a sec. Okay. For someone who might not remember their high school biology, mm -hmm. what exactly is a prokaryote? Imagine a single cell. Okay. Much simpler than the cells that make up our bodies. Mm -hmm. No nucleus, yep. just a jumble of genetic material. Hey. But don't let that fool you, right? because prokaryotes are found virtually everywhere on Earth. So they're tiny but tough. Yeah. I know some bacteria can survive in some pretty crazy places, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Boiling hot springs. Oh, wow. Super salty lakes, even places with almost no oxygen. Really? Prokaryotes have figured out how to thrive where most life would just give up. You said they're everywhere, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing most of us don't spend our days thinking about that. Wow. Why should we care about this invisible world? Good point. Yeah. Think of it this way. Prokaryotes are like the uh, behind the scenes crew of the planet. Okay. They break down dead stuff, recycle nutrients, and even create the oxygen we breathe. Mm -hmm. Without them, the whole system would fall apart. Whoa, so we owe them big time. I remember learning about photosynthesis. Hmm. Plants aren't the only ones doing it right. That's right. Cyanobacteria, which mm -hmm. are prokaryotes, mm -hmm. were the first oxygen-producing organisms billions of years ago. Wow. They completely transformed the planet, mm. paving the way for all the life we see today. That's mind-blowing. Okay, so we've got these ancient adaptable organisms all over the place, right. do all sorts of important jobs. How on earth do scientists even start to classify them? I mean, they're microscopic. Well, for a long time, scientists used what they could see. Okay. Shapes like rods, Shall spheres, or spirals. Yeah. Uh -huh. How they stained in the lab. Yeah. What kinds of food they used. I can see how that would get tricky, though, right? Yeah. Like two bacteria might look similar. Yeah. But actually be really different on the inside. Exactly. Yeah. That's where molecular genetics comes in. Okay. By analyzing their DNA and RNA. All right. Scientists can get a much clearer picture of how prokaryotes are related to each other. Okay. Like building a family tree. So it's like, instead of just looking at someone's face, yeah. we're looking at their entire genetic code. Yeah. That seems way more accurate. You got it. Now, digging deeper into the source material, okay. we see that a good chunk of it focuses on a group called proteobacteria. Why are they the stars of the show? Think of them as the most diverse family in the bacterial kingdom. Hmm. They're split into five classes, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon, Okay. each with its own unique set of characteristics. And I'm guessing some of those characteristics aren't so good for us, right? Yeah. yeah. The source mentioned pathogens quite a bit. Unfortunately, yes. Within the alpha proteobacteria, for instance, we have rickettsia. Go ahead. Ever heard of Rocky Mountain spotted fever or typhus? Oh, yeah. Those are definitely not things you want to get. Exactly. And in the beta proteobacteria, we have the infamous Neisseria family. Okay. Which includes the bacteria responsible for gonorrhea and meningitis. Okay. Now I'm really starting to see why we pay attention to this invisible world. Right. It can have some very real consequences. You're absolutely right. And the list goes on. Oh, no, go. The gamma proteobacteria, for example, is a huge class that includes some very familiar names. Hit me with it. Which one should we be watching out for? Well, E. coli is probably the most famous. Okay. Most strains are harmless, mm -hmm. but some can cause nasty food poisoning. Right. And then there's salmonella, another common culprit in foodborne illnesses. Right. And vibrio cholerae. Okay. Which causes cholera. Okay, so food safety is officially on my mind. Yeah. Anything else lurking in this bacterial family reunion? Don't forget the epsilon proteobacteria, okay. home to Helicobacter pylori, mm -hmm. the tiny terror that causes peptic ulcers. You're really painting a picture here. <laughs> but even with all these bad guys, yeah. it's important to remember that most bacteria are not pathogenic, right? Absolutely. We're just focusing on the ones that directly impact us. Right. The vast majority of proteobacteria are either harmless okay. 
or actually play crucial roles in the environment and even our own bodies. Okay, good to know. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about this huge group, the proteobacteria. Right. But the source material also mentions a bunch of other gram-negative bacteria that aren't part of that family. Yeah. What's going on there? It just shows you how incredibly diverse the bacterial world is. Mm. We've got groups like the spirochetes, mm. which have that distinctive spiral shape and are known for their ability to move around quickly. All right. Some of them are pretty nasty, though, causing diseases like syphilis and Lyme disease. Lyme disease is definitely one you hear about a lot these days. Yeah. Especially for people who spend time outdoors. It's definitely a concern. Then we have the CFB group. Okay. Which sounds like a weird code. It does. But it stands for Cytophaga, Fusobacterium, and Bodyroids. Okay. They're all rod-shaped and can survive without oxygen. Right. Which is pretty cool. Anaerobic, right. Yeah. Well, I remember that term from somewhere. You got it. One of the key members of this group is bacteroids. Okay. They're actually super abundant in our gut, yeah. and most of them are good guys. Okay. Helping us digest food and keeping our gut healthy. So they're like the friendly neighbors in our internal ecosystem. Exactly. Now imagine tiny bacteria that reproduce by budding, right. like little balloons pinching off. Okay. Those are the planktomycetes. Right. And they're often found in water forming these intricate colonies. So they're the architects of the bacterial world. I like that. And last but not least, we have the phototrophic bacteria. Okay. This is a big group with a shared talent. They can capture energy from sunlight, okay. just like plants. Mm -hmm. Some of them even help out with nitrogen fixation, oh. converting nitrogen from the air into a form plants can use. So we're talking about photosynthesis, nitrogen fixation. Mm -hmm. These little guys are like the multitaskers of the microbial world. They truly are. They showcase the incredible diversity and adaptability of prokaryotes. Okay, my mind is already blown, but I know we're just getting started. Yeah. You've still got gram-positive bacteria to explore. Yeah. And then there's that whole other domain of prokaryotes, the eukaryote. <laughs> okay. But we'll save those adventures for another time. There's so much more to discover. Welcome back. I'm excited to delve even deeper into the prokaryotic world with you. Me too. Last time we left off talking about how diverse bacteria are and how they can be both helpful and harmful. It's wild to think these tiny organisms can have such a big impact on us. It really is. Yeah. And that brings us to a question you might be wondering. Okay. If bacteria are so diverse, are all prokaryotes like that? What about archaea? Right. Do they cause any diseases? That's a great question. I'm all ears. Well, here's where things get even more interesting. Okay. Archaea are just as diverse as bacteria, mm. but so far we haven't found any that cause diseases in humans. Wait, really? That's surprising. Why uh, not? It's a bit of a mystery. Yeah. But it could be because their biochemistry and cellular structures are quite different from bacteria. Okay. It might be difficult for them to interact with our cells in a way that would cause harm. So it's like they speak a different language than our bodies. Yeah. So they can't really mess with us. That's a great way to put it. Okay. Of course, there's still so much we don't know about Archaea. Right. So there's always the possibility of new discoveries changing our understanding. That's what I love about science. There's always something new to learn. It's exactly. Okay, switching gears a bit. Okay. Let's go back to those phototrophic bacteria we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. They photosynthesize like plants. Right. But how does that actually work in bacteria? Great question. It's important to remember that phototrophic bacteria aren't all the same. Okay. They've evolved different ways to harness sunlight. Mm. Some, like cyanobacteria, okay. use a process very similar to plants, mm. producing oxygen as a byproduct. Right. That's how they helped create the oxygen-rich atmosphere we have today. So they're like the original solar-powered oxygen factories? Yeah. What about the other phototrophic bacteria. Yeah. The ones that don't produce oxygen. Those are called anoxygenic phototrophs okay. instead of water. Mm -hmm. They use other compounds as electron donors, okay. like sulfur or even organic molecules. Right. They often live in environments where oxygen is scarce. So they've adapted to thrive in those unique niches mm. using different strategies to capture energy. Exactly. It just shows the incredible flexibility of bacterial metabolism. Right. And remember, some of these phototrophs are also nitrogen fixers. Yeah. It's like they're multitasking, powering themselves with sunlight while also providing essential nutrients for other organisms. Okay, I need a minute to process all of this. Yeah. 
It's mind-blowing to think about the sheer scale and complexity of the microbial world. I know. It's like an entire hidden universe operating right under our noses. I know, right? And it gets even more fascinating when we consider how these microbes interact with each other and their environment. Mm. Think about the human microbiome, for instance. The what? Oh, you mean all the bacteria living in and on our bodies? Exactly. It's not just a random collection of microbes, though. Okay. It's a complex community with different species interacting in specific ways. Yeah. And it plays a huge role in our health, from yeah. digestion yeah. to immunity to even our mental well-being. It's like we're walking ecosystems carrying trillions of tiny passengers. That's a great way to think about it. Wow. And like any ecosystem balance is key. Disrupting that balance, like through antibiotic overuse, can lead to all sorts of problems. Right. But nurturing a healthy microbiome through things like diet and lifestyle choices can be incredibly beneficial. So it's not just about avoiding the bad bacteria. It's about supporting the good ones, too. Absolutely. Now, stepping back from our own bodies for a moment. Okay. Let's talk about those symbiotic relationships we mentioned earlier. Right. We know some bacteria can be pathogenic. Yeah. But what about the ones that are helpful or even essential to other organisms? You're talking about those win-win partnerships where both organisms benefit. Exactly. One of the most classic examples is the relationship between nitrogen-fixing bacteria and plants. Okay. Plants need nitrogen to grow, mm -hmm. but they can't use the abundant nitrogen gas in the atmosphere directly. So these nitrogen-fixing bacteria act like tiny fertilizer factories, right? Yeah. Converting nitrogen into a form that plants can actually use. You got it. Yeah. They set up shop and plant roots and get to work. In return, the plants provide the bacteria with sugars and other nutrients they need to survive. That's amazing. It's like they've figured out a perfect system for sharing resources and helping each other thrive. Nature is full of these incredible collaborations. Yeah. It really emphasizes how interconnected life is on Earth. Speaking of interconnectedness, yeah. let's circle back to classification for a second. Okay. Earlier we talked about how scientists used to group bacteria based on their shape, staining, and metabolism. Mm -hmm. But now we have molecular genetics. Right. So... Are those old methods still relevant? They still played a role. Okay. Those observable characteristics can tell us a lot about a bacterium's lifestyle. Right. And how it interacts with its environment. Okay. But as we've discussed, DNA analysis gives us a much deeper understanding of their evolutionary history mm -hmm. and how they're related to each other. So it's like having different pieces of a puzzle. Yeah. Each one gives us a different perspective. Right. And together they create a more complete picture. Exactly. It's not about replacing the old ways, okay. but rather combining them with new tools to create a more comprehensive and accurate understanding. And I bet that understanding is constantly evolving as scientists make new discoveries. You're absolutely right. Wow. The field of microbiology is constantly changing, mm. especially with advancements in DNA sequencing and bioinformatics. Okay. We're constantly finding new species, refining our classifications, and gaining a deeper understanding of the intricate relationship relationships between microbes and the rest of the living world. It's like we're explorers charting a vast, uncharted territory. I love that analogy. Okay. And speaking of exploring our source material, dives into some specific groups of bacteria and archaea, okay. highlighting their unique characteristics and ecological roles. Okay. Let's start with those proteobacteria we talked about earlier. Okay. Specifically, the five classes within that phylum. Okay. I'm ready to dive back into that bacterial family tree. Perfect. Remember, each class encompasses a wide range of species. Right. From helpful nitrogen fixers to those harmful pathogens we discussed. And Let's take a closer look at some of the key players in each class. All right. Starting with the alpha proteobacteria. Bring on the alpha proteobacteria. Who are the standouts in this group? Well, we already mentioned rickettsia. Right. Which includes the species that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever and typhus. Mm -hmm. They're obligate intracellular parasites, oh. meaning they can only survive inside the cells of their hosts, mm -hmm. which in this case is usually us or other animals. So they're like tiny hijackers taking over our cells for their own benefit. Yeah. Not cool. You definitely not. But not all alpha proteobacteria are harmful. Okay. In fact, some are incredibly important for agriculture. Mm. Think about rhizobium, for example. Okay, rhizobium, what do they do? There are nitrogen-fixing powerhouses that form symbiotic relationships with legumes, okay. which are plants like beans, 
peas, and clover. Right. They live in nodules on the plant roots, okay. converting atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia, Ooh. which the plant can then use to grow. So they're like tiny fertilizer factories helping those plants thrive. Exactly. They're essential for agriculture and help enrich the soil with nitrogen, hmm. which benefits other plants as well. Wow. Now let's move on to the beta proteobacteria. Okay. Here we find some more familiar names, okay. like, like Neisseria. Right, we mentioned Neisseria gonorrhea earlier. Yeah. The bacteria that causes gonorrhea. That's right. Okay. And another species in that genus, mm -hmm. Neisseria meningitis, yeah. can cause meningitis. Right. A serious infection of the membrane surrounding the brain and spinal cord. Oh, wow. It's a stark reminder that even though these organisms are tiny, yeah. they can have a significant impact on our health. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, what other notable members are hanging out in this beta proteobacteria club? We've also got Bordetella, uh, which includes the species that causes whooping cough, mm -hmm. a highly contagious respiratory infection. Okay. And then there's Burkholderia, a genus that includes both beneficial and pathogenic species. Mm. Some Burkholderia species can cause respiratory infections in people with weakened immune systems, right. while others are actually helpful to plants. It's interesting how closely related bacteria can have such different effects on us and other organisms. Yeah. It really highlights how complex the microbial world is. It really does. Now, let's move on to the gamma proteobacteria. Yeah. The largest and most diverse class of proteobacteria. Wow. Get ready. Okay. Because this is where we find some of the most well-known bacteria. I'm excited. Hit me with some of the biggest names in this group. Well, how about Escherichia coli? Okay. Better known as E. coli. Right. It's a normal resident of our gut, yeah. helping with digestion and producing vitamin K. I've heard of E. coli before. Yeah. But usually in the context of food poisoning. You're right. That's because some strains of E. coli have acquired virulence factors. Okay. Basically tools that make them harmful. All right. These strains can cause a range of illnesses, including food poisoning, urinary tract infections, and even more serious conditions. So it's like the same species, but some have gone rogue and learned how to make us sick. That's a good way to think about it. It's all about the specific genes they carry. Right. And how those genes interact with our bodies. Okay. And while we're on the topic of foodborne illnesses, mm -hmm. let's not forget about salmonella. Right. There are actually over 2,500 different serotypes of salmonella. Really? And some are definitely more pathogenic than others. Wow, over 2,500. It sounds like we're outnumbered. That's the thing about bacteria. They're incredibly diverse and adaptable. Yeah. And unfortunately, that adaptability also applies to Vibrio cholerae. Okay. The bacterium responsible for cholera. Mm. This severe diarrheal disease can be fatal if not treated quickly. Oh, wow. And it's still a major problem in areas with poor sanitation and limited access to clean water. It's a reminder that even though we've made great strides in public health, right. bacterial infections are still a major global concern. Absolutely. But let's not forget that the gamma proteobacteria also include some incredibly helpful bacteria. Oh. Take Pseudomonas, for example, oh. a diverse genus with species that are essential for nutrient cycling and even play a role in bioremediation. Bioremediation. That sounds intriguing. What does that mean? It means using living organisms to clean up pollutants. Oh, OK. Some Pseudomonas species can actually break down pollutants like oil and pesticides, wow. making them valuable valuable allies in cleaning up contaminated environments. Wow, so they're like tiny environmental superheroes. Exactly. They help us address some of the environmental challenges we've created. Right. It's a great example of how understanding bacteria can lead to solutions for real-world problems. Okay, so far we've covered the alpha, beta, and gamma proteobacteria. Right. What about the delta proteobacteria? Yeah. Are, are they as well known as their cousins? They might not be as famous, okay. but they have their own unique talents. All right. Many delta proteobacteria are what we call sulfate reducing bacteria, which means they use sulfate as an electron acceptor in their respiration. I'm trying to remember my chemistry here. Yeah. So instead of breathing oxygen like we do, they use sulfate. You got it. And this plays a crucial role in the sulfur cycle. Okay. 
particularly in marine and freshwater environments. Right. These bacteria help recycle sulfur, which is an essential nutrient for all living things. So they're like the sulfur specialists of the bacterial world, mm -hmm. keeping that element flowing through the ecosystem. Exactly. And some delta proteobacteria are even more fascinating. Okay. They can form something called mixospores. Mixospores. Which are these incredibly tough, dormant cells that can survive extreme conditions. Well, yeah. It's like they have their own built-in survival bunkers. That's incredible. It makes sense, though. Yeah. Bacteria have been around for billions of years. Right. They've definitely learned a thing or two about survival. They certainly have. Yeah. And finally, we come to the last class of proteobacteria, the epsilon proteobacteria. Right. This is a smaller group. Okay. But it still includes some important players. Okay. Like Helicobacter pylori, which we talked about earlier. That's the bacteria that causes those pesky peptic ulcers. Exactly. Yeah. And another important genus in this group is Campylobacter. Oh. Campycobacter jejuni in particular okay. is a common cause of food poisoning, mm -hmm. often associated with contaminated poultry. Okay. It's a reminder to always be careful handling raw meat and to cook it thoroughly. Food safety is definitely a recurring theme in this deep dive. I'm starting to think I need to invest in a good food thermometer. A wise idea. Yeah. But in all seriousness, yeah. understanding these different classes of proteobacteria helps us appreciate the incredible diversity of bacteria mm -hmm. and the many roles they play in our world, right. both beneficial and harmful. Yeah. It's all about understanding the nuances of their biology and their interactions with us and our environment. My mind is officially blown. We've gone from the broad overview of bacteria to a deep dive into one of the most diverse phyla. And we're still just scratching the surface. What's next on our prokaryotic adventure? Well, remember all those other gram-negative bacteria we mentioned? Yeah. The uh, ones that aren't part of the proteobacteria family? Right, like the spirochetes and the CFB group? Mm -hmm. They definitely deserve some more attention. They certainly do. And they each bring their own unique characteristics and ecological roles to the table. Okay. Plus, we still haven't even touched on gram-positive bacteria. Right. Or the fascinating world of archaea. Okay, my brain is ready for more. <laughs> Let's keep exploring these incredible microscopic worlds. I'm happy to be your guide. Let's dive in and see what other wonders we can uncover together. Welcome back to our prokaryotic adventure. Last time we uh, dove deep into the diverse world of proteobacteria, right. exploring their different classes and the roles they play from causing diseases to helping plants grow. Yeah. It's amazing how much is going on in this invisible world. It really is. And we're not done yet. Oh. Remember those other gram-negative bacteria we mentioned? The ones that aren't part of the proteobacteria family? Yeah. We've got the spirochetes, okay. the CFB group, and a few more to explore. Right, like those spiral-shaped spirochetes that can cause Lyme disease. Yeah. They definitely left an impression. They're definitely memorable. And mm. their unique shape plays a big role in their ability to move around. Okay. They have this internal flagellum, hmm. kind of like a corkscrew, that helps them propel themselves through their environment. So they're like the tiny drill bits of the bacterial world. Right. Able to burrow their way through different tissues. Exactly. And as you mentioned, some spirochetes are pathogenic. Right. Treponema pallidum. Okay. The bacteria that causes syphilis yeah. is another example of how these tiny organisms can have a major impact on human health. It's a reminder that even though we can't see them, these microbes are constantly interacting with us. Yeah. And sometimes those interactions can have serious consequences. Absolutely. Now let's move on to the CFB group. Remember, that stands for Cytophaga, Fusobacterium, and Bacteroids. Right. They're all rod-shaped and anaerobic, mm. meaning they don't need oxygen to survive. Yep. They're often found in the human gut. Right. And as we discussed earlier, Bacteroids are actually incredibly important for our digestion. Right. They're like our gut's best friends, helping us break down those complex carbohydrates and yeah. keeping things running smoothly. Exactly. But just like any community, there can be some troublemakers. Oh. Some fusobacterium species, for instance, oh. have been linked to gum disease and even colorectal cancer. Really? It's a reminder that the balance of our microbiome is incredibly important for our health. So it's not just about having good bacteria. It's yeah. about having the right balance of different species working together. That's a great point. It's all about maintaining a healthy ecosystem within our bodies. Right. Now let's talk about a group of bacteria that really challenge our understanding of bacterial cell structure. Okay. The planktomyces. Okay, planktomyces. What makes them so special? 
They have some really unique features. Right. For one, they have a compartmentalized cell structure right. with a membrane-bound nucleoid. Hmm. That's unusual for bacteria, right. which typically have their DNA floating freely in the cytoplasm. So they're kind of blurring the lines between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, yeah. those more complex cells that make up our bodies. Exactly. They challenge our traditional understanding of what a bacterial cell should look like. Uh. And they also reproduce differently Okay. using budding instead of the usual binary fission we see in most bacteria. Budding like a yeast cell. Mm -hmm. So they pinch off a little piece of themselves to create a new cell. That's right. It's another example of the incredible diversity of reproductive strategies that bacteria have evolved. Wow. Planktomycetes are often found in aquatic environments. Okay. And some species play important roles in breaking down organic matter. So they're like the recyclers of the aquatic world, yeah. keeping those ecosystems clean and balanced. Exactly. Now, before we move on to gram-positive bacteria, yeah. there's one more group of gram-negative bacteria I want to mention. The phototrophic bacteria. Right. Those are the ones that can capture energy from sunlight, just like plants. Exactly. And they're incredibly diverse. Okay. Some, like the cyanobacteria, perform oxygenic photosynthesis, mm -hmm. producing oxygen as a byproduct. Right. They're the ones responsible for the great oxidation event. Okay. Which transformed Earth's atmosphere billions of years ago. Wow. And paved the way for the evolution of life as we know it. So they're like the unsung heroes of the planet, yeah. shaping the very air we breathe. Absolutely. But not all phototrophic bacteria produce oxygen. Right. Some perform anoxygenic photosynthesis okay. using other compounds like sulfur or organic molecules as electron donors. Right. These bacteria often live in environments where oxygen is scarce, right. like deep lakes or sediments. So they've adapted to those unique niches, finding ways to capture energy without relying on oxygen. Exactly. And remember, some of these phototrophic bacteria are also nitrogen fixers, yeah. adding another layer of ecological importance to their repertoire. Right. They truly showcase the incredible metabolic diversity of bacteria and their crucial roles in supporting life on Earth. Okay, I'm ready to switch gears now and dive into the world of gram-positive bacteria. Mm -hmm. What sets them apart from their gram-negative counterparts? Well, as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. gram-positive bacteria have a thicker peptinoglycan layer in their cell walls. Okay. Which is what gives them that positive result in the gram stain test. Right. This structural difference also affects how they interact with antibiotics and other compounds. So it's like, not just a color difference. Right. It's a fundamental difference in their cell structure mm. that has real world implications. Exactly. Now, gram positive bacteria are divided into two main groups. Okay. Based on the guanine and cytosine content in their DNA, oh. high G plus C and low G plus C. All right. And within each group, we find a fascinating array of bacteria with diverse ecological roles and impacts on human health. Okay, I'm intrigued. Let's start with the high G plus C group. Okay. What are some of the key players in this category? Well, one of the most well-known members of the high G plus C group is the genus Streptomyces. Okay. These bacteria are incredibly important for medicine because they produce a wide range of antibiotics. Wait, so the very bacteria we fight with antibiotics yeah. are also the source of some of our most powerful weapons against them. It's a fascinating paradox. It is. Streptomyces have evolved the ability to produce antibiotics to compete with other bacteria in their environment. Okay. And we've cleverly harnessed their natural defenses to develop life-saving drugs. It's like we've turned their own weapons against them. Well, what other notable high G plus C bacteria are there? We've also got the genus Mycobacterium, okay. which includes some infamous pathogens like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, mm the bacteria responsible for tuberculosis. Right. This respiratory disease is still a major global health concern. Yeah. Highlighting the ongoing challenges we face in mm -hmm. controlling bacterial infections. It's a reminder that even though we've made significant progress in medicine, we can't become complacent. Right. Bacteria are constantly evolving, and we need to stay vigilant in our efforts to understand and combat them. Absolutely. Now let's shift gears and talk about the low G plus C gram-positive bacteria. Okay. This group includes some very familiar names. Okay. Like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. 
Oh, those are definitely names I've heard before. I know Staphylococcus aureus, for example. Yeah. Can cause some nasty skin infections. That's right. Staphylococcus aureus is a common cause of skin infections. Yeah. But it can also cause more serious infections like pneumonia and sepsis. Really? And streptococcus is another genus that includes some well-known pathogens. Okay. Like streptococcus pyogenes, right. which causes strep throat. So these low G plus C bacteria are responsible for some of the most common bacterial infections we encounter. They certainly are, but just like with other groups of bacteria. Not all of them are harmful. Okay. In fact, some low G plus C bacteria are incredibly beneficial. Right. Take lactobacillus, for example. Right. These bacteria are commonly found in yogurt, cheese, and other fermented foods. So they're the ones responsible for that tangy yogurt flavor I love. Exactly. And they're also part of the normal human microbiome, yeah. playing a role in gut health and digestion. Hmm. It's another example of how bacteria can be both beneficial and harmful depending on the species and the context. It seems like there's always more to learn about the complex relationships between bacteria and humans. Right. Okay. So we've covered gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria. Mm-hmm. And now I think it's finally time to tackle the other domain of prokaryotes, mm. archaea. Oh, okay. What makes them so different from bacteria? Archaea are fascinating. Yeah. Because even though they share the prokaryotic classification with bacteria, right. meaning they lack a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles, right. they're actually as different from bacteria as bacteria are from us. Whoa, that's mind-blowing. So they're like the distant cousins of bacteria. Yeah. Sharing some basic similarities, but having their own unique evolutionary path. Exactly. Their cell walls have a different composition. Okay. Their membranes contain unique lipids. Right. And their genetic machinery is more similar to eukaryotes, mm -hmm. like us, yeah. than to bacteria. Okay. And one of the most striking things about archaea is their ability to thrive in extreme environments. Right. I remember you mentioning them earlier. They're like the extremophiles of the microbial world. Yeah. Hanging out in places most life wouldn't dare to go. Exactly. Think about places like boiling hot springs. Oh, wow. Super salty lakes. Quite. Or even the highly acidic environments of mine drainage. Really? These are places where most organisms would simply perish. Right. But archaea have evolved unique adaptations that allow them to not only survive, but actually thrive in these harsh conditions. Okay, let's get specific. What are some examples of archaea that really push the limits of life? Well, one group that stands out are the methanogens. Okay. These archaea produce methane as a byproduct of their metabolism, mm -hmm. and they're found in a variety of anaerobic environments like swamps, right. marshes, yeah. and even the guts of some animals. So they're the ones responsible for that swamp gas we sometimes hear about. Exactly. And they're also important for our understanding of early life on Earth. Mm. because methane was likely a major component of the early atmosphere. Yeah. Studying methanogens helps us piece together the puzzle of how life first arose on our planet. It's like peering back through billions of years of evolutionary history. What other extreme environments do Archaea call home? Well, how about those super salty environments we mentioned earlier? Right. Halophiles are a group of Archaea that thrive in extremely salty conditions, mm. like those found in the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake. Wow. They've evolved special adaptations to maintain their cellular balance and prevent dehydration in these challenging environments. It's amazing how life finds a way to adapt, even in the most extreme conditions. It, yeah. it really expands our understanding of what's possible. Absolutely. And then there are the thermophiles, okay. Archaea that love the heat. All right. They're found in places like hot springs and hydrothermal vents right. where temperatures can reach boiling or even higher. Oh, wow. They've evolved enzymes and cellular structures that can withstand these extreme temperatures, mm. making them essential players in these unique ecosystems. It's incredible to think about these organisms thriving in environments that would be instantly lethal to most other life forms. It's a testament to the power of evolution and the incredible diversity of life on Earth. Okay. It, we've only just scratched the surface of understanding the archaeal world. Mm -hmm. There's still so much more to discover about their biology, e their ecological roles, right. and their potential applications in biotechnology. Well, on that note of wonder and discovery, <laughs> I think we need to wrap up our prokaryotic adventure for today. Mm. We've covered so much ground exploring the vast and diverse world of Bacteria and archaea. Yeah, it's been a lot. We've delved into their structure, mm -hmm. their metabolism, Plus. their ecological roles, 
and their impact on human health. It's been quite a journey. We've seen how these tiny organisms play a much bigger role in our world than we often realize. Yeah. They're essential for nutrient cycling decomposition, yeah. the production of oxygen, and even the development of life-saving antibiotics. It's a reminder that we need to respect and appreciate these microscopic powerhouses. Yeah. Even though we can't see them with the naked eye, yeah. they're constantly shaping our planet and influencing our lives in profound ways. Absolutely. And as we continue to explore the microbial world, we're sure to uncover even more fascinating and unexpected aspects of prokaryotic biology. So the next time you think about bacteria or archaea, don't just think about disease. Right. Remember the nitrogen fixers that nourish our crops, the decomposers that recycle nutrients, the oxygen producers that sheep our atmosphere, and all the other prokaryotic species that make our planet so vibrant and diverse. Take a moment to appreciate the invisible world teeming with life all around us. Yes. A world that's constantly interacting with us and shaping our planet in ways we're only beginning to understand. And who knows what other secrets and wonders await us as we continue to explore this fascinating realm of prokaryotes. Exactly. Until next time, keep diving deep and stay curious.